Hey everyone, welcome to History Shop Talk. My name is Rob, and today we're going to be talking about the Shermans versus the Cats, in particular the Tiger and the Panther tanks, and we'll look at a couple other things along the way. Now the inf uh, inspiration for this video uh, comes from a video that I posted recently about 30 Core in Operation Market Garden and how, um, how we should evaluate the decision of 30 Corps not to advance on the September 21st. Once they had crossed the wall, the 82nd had done their amphibious operation. The British sent four tanks across under a gentleman named Sergeant Robinson. And, you know, there's a classic scene in a bridge too far, you know, hey, you know, the British are in trouble up there and you're stopping to drink tea, right? That's the, the myth that we've all seen. And it's an accusation that um, basically the 30 Corps failed to do their job. Um, I think that um, in that briefing, one of the things I talked about was the distinction of before uh, the crossing of the bridge and after. Uh, there's definitely some criticism, you know, of their conduct uh, during the preparation for the breach, or you know, for seizing the bridge. Um, but once you get across the bridge, imagine you're Sergeant Robinson and you've got your four Sherman sitting there and you're being told to go up the road. You know, let's let's evaluate that. And perhaps a bit carelessly, I just uh, in one of the slides, I slapped up there some, uh, you know, four to one, five to one ratios. Uh, and I was talking in the video about the consequences of sending those four tanks up the road. Uh, here you can see we have the 75 millimeter gun and this little picture has got the long barreled um, Firefly 76 millimeter gun and we're talking about the relative uh, likelihood of success of Robinson to, to um, Advance down that road uh, the terrain was such that he would be he wouldn't be able to deploy his uh, tanks abreast that they would be in line coming up on a tank that was in a defensive position, um, you know, properly camouflaged, etc. But, you know, I had I threw these ratios in there just to sort of to help the viewer conceptualize the impression at the time. It's like, well, um, in the video I mentioned that maybe the Firefly had better odds than than the Sherman than these these odds shown here. But the the fact of the matter is that the Sherman tank's odds were bad. Well, of course, no sooner had I posted this video when I come across a video by the chieftain that basically tells me I don't know what I'm talking about. And specifically, this is the Myths of the American Armor Tank Fest uh, video that he does. And it's actually very good. It's, he covers about eight different myths. Um, and it's got some interesting uh, insight from official studies and some um, you know detailed scholarly kind of work. Um, and one thing, uh, you know, as I started to look around, you know, he's telling me that I'm my impression is wrong. And, you know, golly gee, here's uh, all these other satellite uh, forums and blogs and videos that are referencing this video where people take his arguments and kind of put their uh, additional uh, facts and figures around them. And in my uh, estimation, don't always apply uh, sound logic and before you know it you have a whole sort of um, counter narrative that the traditional narrative of the Sherman tank being an inferior tank is is just it's all a myth okay I don't think that's exactly what the chieftain's saying but uh, a lot of people take his words and then go beyond uh, what he is suggesting okay so you know, I'm gonna. I'm looking at his work. I'm looking at stuff that references his work, but along the way, I also find uh, some good information or good, you know, documentation that's suggesting that the traditional narrative of the M4 being Sherman being a inferior tank that it's that it's a true statement, right? So, which is the truth? Is is you know the five to one myth a, a myth? Is the inferiority of the Sherman tank a myth? Uh, what's what is the truth? That's kind of where we're going to go in this video, and then we're going to come back and evaluate Sergeant Robinson's predicament on September twenty first, nineteen forty four. So in his um, presentation, 
uh, at the tank fest, uh, he references two um, surveys or two studies in particular. It's the work of Steve Zalaga and this British survey uh, done in 1952 of the uh, European theater. And uh, so we're going to take a look at some, a couple of the myths that were most important uh, from my point of view. Um, the two that I really cared about were myths seven and eight. This goes to the inferiority or, you know, the, the traditional narrative that the Sherman was an inferior tank. Uh, myth number four, I need to include it for just for one reason. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be referencing one of the books called Death Traps by um, Belton Cooper. And uh, in, if you watch the video, the Tank Fest video, uh, he'll bring up this book, and then he's going to proceed to uh, discredit the book, and I don't think that was his intent, but um, in fact, right off the bat, you know, the, one of the first things he says is, it's a great book, I highly recommend it, uh, but then he proceeds, the, there's a TV, he's up in a, um, you know, like a pavilion, and he's giving a speech to, or, you know, a presentation to a group of tourists who are at a D-Day um, activity, and he has a TV up front that has his slides up, and the slide says Cooper's book is wrong. And then he talks about the fact that Belton uh, Cooper's book makes the claim, quote, that the reason we don't have the Pershing is because General Patton didn't like them, unquote. Um, he kind of poo-poos the, the book, suggesting that, it, you know, you need to assess everything you read, you know, this is not a historical work. It's a memoir, as if memoirs aren't historical works. I, I think what he means is it's not some sort of scholarly, you know, formal, official type of work. As the fact of the matter is, memoirs are historical uh, documents. Um, you know, he, he points out, you know, where did he get, where did he, uh, Cooper, get the idea that Patton was involved in tank development? Nobody knows kind of dismissively suggested, and then he says, basically, you know, it's not true. Suffice it to say, it's not true. So, you know, he starts off, the book is great, read it, but, it, but, 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 you know, and you kind of come away with, you know, should I trust this book uh, or not, to be honest? Okay, so real quick, I want to, you know, talk to you about the book. I think it is credible. Um, before we go into what Cooper actually wrote, it's important because there are other folks out there who are sort of uh, glomming on to this uh, this narrative that somehow um, there's this myth that General Patton is the reason the M26 wasn't fielded. This guy adds in some additional caveats like as early as D-Day. Um, not sure where that comes from, but you know you have people who are saying that that it's Patton's fault that we didn't have M26s on D-Day, Pershing's on D-Day. Uh, and right here, to put it shortly, General Patton had no real influence on tank development and tank deployment. General McNair, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, if we're going to attack somebody's work, I think we need to make sure we understand what they said. You know, there is a difference between development and priority, you know, priorities, right? You might be working... The fact that Patton um, is, may influence priorities ha doesn't have anything to do with whether he's involved in development. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, in the next slide here, I'm going to show you, out of 333 pages, this is, as far as I can tell, this is every meaningful clip that relates to per uh, Patton and the Pershing. Okay. He talks about how Patton wasn't very enthusiastic about it on sort of doctrinal reasons. He talked about Patton's assessment of fuel consumption, that it would that the M4 would be faster, more agile, better equipped for the mission of the armor divisions, which were in his eyes designed to penetrate and disrupt. Um, Cooper points out that you know he was correct about it being lighter and require less fuel, but he was actually wrong about the fact that it was more agile, that the higher horsepower actually made the uh, Pershing more agile, and that it's, um, it's loading, the tracks were wider, so it's loading uh, per, you know, per square inch was actually better and made it more um, suitable for off-road conditions, actually. Uh, this, this is where we start to get into, into the myth of 
you know, Cooper saying s somehow that Patton didn't like the Sherman or whatever. Okay, you know, however, Patton persisted in his views. He insisted that we should downgrade the M26 and concentrate on the M4. His rank and authority overwhelmed resistance. Shafe comes up with, uh, you know, notifies Washington that we need to de-emphasize it based upon this uh, recommendation, presumably. And in Cooper's eyes, this has, is a disastrous decision that would have catastrophic uh, effects. Okay. Later in the book, he talks about uh, Patton's recommendation to concentrate on the M4 because it was fast, blah, blah, blah. was disastrous, and he goes on to, um, to say... This is an important part here, but he, you know, Patton had extreme flair for getting his way. So let's kind of think about uh, this just a little bit. If Patton was the decision maker, if Patton was the person who could kill the tank, does he really need to persuade anyone or does he just need to make the decision to do it? So as you look at what Cooper says, basically he's saying Patton wasn't a big fan of it in the sense that it didn't, the Pershing, it didn't um, satisfy the doctrinal requirements the way the M4 did. It doesn't say he didn't like it. It just says that it didn't satisfy the, the, the expectations that it was not as favorable for the doctrine. Okay, And he certainly didn't stop it. Um, he, he didn't kill it, for lack of a better term. Uh, nowhere in here does the word D-Day appear, right? <laughs> There's nothing about, uh, from Cooper at least, suggesting uh, that the Pershing wasn't available because of, by D-Day because of Patton. So there's quite a bit of, you know, out there that's talking about this myth, and there's a, a lot that goes into it. And Belton, uh, or Cooper, never says this stuff, right? <laughs> He basically says that Patton used his influence to deprioritize and Schaefer slash Washington made a decision to, to deprioritize and that in his opinion that this was a disastrous decision with catastrophic consequences. Okay. Now, he cites specifically uh, this, all this stuff here on page 28 through whatever is relating to uh, Tidworth Downs activity in 1994 when they came over and all the key leaders got together and there was live demonstrations of all the equipment except the Pershing which was done on a video or an eight millimeter film you know and so here you have people looking at live tanks M4s and a video of a maybe tank and um, you know it's maybe suggesting that Let's, let's focus on the tank we got. Let's focus on the real tank, okay? Now, it is, it's interesting to note that, um, you know, in September of 43, the initial request for 500 was denied, but normally if you think that a tank is now going to be more advanced, you know, more further along in its development in January, you would expect a larger order. But in fact, they um, decided to go with 250. So... I don't know. It does if anyone knows where this Shafe uh, directive is? I'd love to see it. Did did it even get um, you know created when they went to Tidworth Downs? Did um, did Patton's per, uh, you know views prevail? Did Shafe write the the memo? Did it get downgraded? But coincidentally or otherwise, it went from a request of 500 down to a request of 200. Okay, and then later, of course, it gets bumped up. Okay, so maybe that's coincidence. Maybe it's um, you know the end customer getting their getting their way. We know that Patton didn't kill the Sherman, right? That if he had killed the Sherman, the Army wouldn't have worked to get it into the field and get it tested. And they actually had two battles, main major battles: the Battle of Cologne and the Battle of Paderborn uh, in March of '45, and were able to test this thing. So. Um, I think um, probably the one, you know, major thing that we have to be kind of critical of Cooper on here is he has the view that this was a disastrous decision. Like, okay, he's entitled to his opinion. But remember, let's go to the Eastern Front for a moment. Um, what happened at the Battle of Kursk when they deployed the, the Tiger and the Panther before they were ready for prime time, right? 
that didn't go so well. So rushing a tank into battle, if you're in January of 44 and you're preparing for a D-Day in May, and at that time it was still scheduled for May, you're talking about four months. You have an imaginary tank on a, on a video as opposed to a real tank. It's completely, if we put ourselves in the respective positions of Patton, of Eisenhower, of DC and uh, McNair, you have the, the guy who's gonna be responsible for conducting the operation, looking at a real tank, the M4, and a video of a tank, the M26, saying, I think we ought to prioritize the real tank. Okay, and the Supreme Commander, Eisenhower, saying, yeah, I agree. Let's focus on the thing that actually works. And they send that back to Washington. And here you have McNair, who's trying to get this troublesome tank out. And he's trying to get ready for D-Day and make sure that the M4 is properly serviced. And he's got this T-26 that's just given him all fits. And the end customer says, nah, we don't need this tank so much. Um, it's completely reasonable to think that Patton did indeed influence this decision. And we can argue, I think Cooper is uh, wrong to, um, to think that simply by delaying the tank, imagine if we had tried to deploy this thing on D-Day, like the one person, the one article above suggested. Okay, so you get start getting tanks in March, April, and you base your operation here in D-Day on a tank that's never been tested, and it doesn't have an amphibious dual drive version, and you roll onto the beaches, and the thing starts breaking down left and right, and the most important operation of the war is being compromised by an untested tank when you have a bunch of M4 sitting there ready to go. Uh, there's a lot of perspectives in making decisions about invasions, and I think it was totally reasonable for Patton to, A, prioritize the, the Sherman, Eisenhower to concur in that, and Washington to say, yeah, we'll get the M26 when it's a little bit further along. That's all totally uh, reasonable. So he's entitled to his opinion, but in this case, I don't think that it's particularly um, disastrous you know, it's unfortunate that it wasn't ready sooner. Maybe the battle bulge. You know, who knows? Okay, so now let's take a look at just, you know, should we trust this book? Generally speaking, I think the answer is yes. It's a credible first-person account. He was on the battlefields doing battlefield assessments, you know, etc. Um, he has photographic evidence. Uh, let's face it, this guy is a lieutenant in a maintenance company. He's not the source of some sort of patent killed the Pershing myth. Um, I don't, I've never ever in all my, re I've been reading books on World War II since, uh, you know, 1975 or thereabouts, and I've never really heard the patent kill the Pershing myth, to be honest. Uh, whenever you talk about Pershings, it was the what if tank, you know, what if it had been ready earlier? And it was always sort of this problematic tank that was having issues it, it, it all falls down into two buckets it was a problematic troublesome tank and when it finally arrived it was really cool you know what if gosh so i do think that uh, cooper and his book death traps after reading it is credible um it's a good read it's eight bucks amazon i uh, highly recommend you get it and make your own determination um but I do think it is the perspective matters, right? This is four or five paragraphs of, of a lieutenant given his views on, a, on an issue uh, out of 333 pages. So I don't think that uh, we should disqualify his work in other regards because of this theoretical myth. Okay, so let's continue on now. Let's move on to um, myth number seven. This is the one that really counts. You know, it took five uh, tanks to kill a cat. Um, everything, you know, one of the things that Nicholas, the chieftain says, Nicholas Moran says, is that, you know, everything was a tiger, you know. Everyone was mistaking Mark IVs for Mark VIs. Uh, he talks about, you know, well, the American platoon is a five-tank platoon, the smallest tactical unit, and that, uh, that the Sherman was designed to be a part of an army of systems, okay, of artillery, close air, combined arms, that sort of stuff, not in isolation. It's like, okay, I'm not entirely sure how this 
how these comments, uh, the, the the five to one, I think there's a completely valid point to be made here that the five to one sort of is a, comes from this, this four structure thing here. Okay. Um, but I don't think that everyone is mistaking a Mark four for a Mark six. We'll talk about that in a minute, but, um, and okay. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter if it was part of a system. You know, the, the myth is that it took, you know, X number of Shermans to kill one cat, right? Uh, one tiger, one panther. Um, and so if you're evaluating the tank, then the, then the supporting arms don't really matter. If you're, if you're evaluating the, the combined arms of the United States, the allies versus the combined arms of the Germans, okay, that's a different argument. So um, I think we're starting to see a little bit of, I don't inherently agree with the, the, this myth, but we'll come back to it in a, in a moment. Uh, he goes on to cite Zalaga's work and quotes him and says, quote, but, and this is a direct quote, between D-Day and the fall of Germany, guess how many uh, times American tanks met Tiger I tanks, unquote. Now, that's a pretty specific statement, uh, Tiger Ones. Okay, do we, you know, do we really need to get that specific? Um, isn't Sherman, whether it's a 75 or 76 against Tiger, whether it's a one or a two, you know, Anyway, um, during the whole of the European campaign, there were only three engagements according to Zalaga's work. And one of them, the Sherman won. Okay, so the Sherman won a Sherman on Tiger engagement. And one of them was a Pershing. Well, okay, guess what? That's not a Sherman engagement. Okay, it's a Pershing engagement. And one of them, the Tigers were on the road. Okay, if, the, if you're loading tires on a railroad, they're not prepared for combat. Um, they're not able to conduct combat in a fair fight. That's not, a, that's not an engagement. That's a slaughter. So, th so what they're saying, what Zalaga's saying, is there's one single Sherman on tire engagement in the entire European theater from D-Day to the end of the war. Um, we'll come back to that. At first, I thought uh, he was referring to the Battle of Ericourt because uh, Nicholas moves directly into the Battle of Ericourt, starts uh, talking about it, and showing how uh, 75 millimeter uh, Shermans actually did pretty well against the Panthers. And, and, but this battle is, is an example of, we're not talking about tank on tank, we're talking about systems, right, with, with supporting arms. The, the Panthers lost, okay, but they were up against a much more capable combined arms team. That's why they lost, not because the Panthers were worse tanks or inferior tanks. They lost because they were up against a superior combined arm teams, period, the end. Um, at this point, he goes on, uh, somewhere after the Battle of Ericourt, uh, Nicholas goes on and refers to the British Army Operational Research Group study of 1952. And he you know, he talks about some of their findings. The winner was usually who shot first. Um, you, you know, you don't open the engagement unless you're at a tactical advantage. And as a result, you're calm and collected and the other guy's having a significant emotional event. Okay, that's all true. Um, but then he goes on to cite two numbers here. One says that the Americans estimated the Shermans had an average of 3.6 times more effective than a Panther. Parenthes I've added the parentheses. That means they had a 3.6 to 1 advantage. The parentheses is mine. Uh, the other is the British concluded they wanted a 2.2 to 1 advantage. Okay, this implies that they were at a dis disadvantage, that they needed 2.2 Shermans to defeat a tank. So, okay, so out of all this stuff, this sort of kind of poo pooing the idea that the Shermans couldn't handle the cats. There's only one counter bullet to that, and that's right here, uh, that the British wanted a two to one, unless this was a misspeak, right? Um, you know, if maybe one of these is a misspeak. I'm not sure. I'm not saying it was um, misrepresented. It just might have been. Uh, th these are exact quotes, but maybe uh, Nicholas intended to say something like the British concluded they had a, that they had a two point one advantage. I'm not sure, right? So at this point, I'm kind of confused. The Americans are saying they have the advantage. The British are saying they don't have the advantage. So which is the truth? Okay, so let's very quickly, what do we agree on? I agree absolutely that the five to one myth is 
a new thing. The specific ratio of 5 to 1 is a relatively new phenomenon. And it is most likely based upon the uh, tank structure, right? You send out a tank platoon to, to deal with the problem. You don't send out one tank. Um, what is not correct is to assume that by debunking the 5 to 1 as a, as a myth, that the many to one was not a reality. The fact is that many to one was a reality. It was a reality by, by countless firsthand testimony and by, uh, um, I'm going to call it scientific statistical you know, survey data um, that Nicholas cited here, the um, British uh, study in 1952. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, just a real crude timeline of tanks. Uh, you know, when the war starts, the, the, the main, the best tanks are the Mark III's and IVs. Um, they're used to basically win everything up through the Battle of France. Then you get into the desert. Along comes the Grant Lee. They at least uh, have a fighting chance. This is a terrible tank, you know, but it's got a gun that can actually kill a tank, um, finally. Um, you start to see other tanks like the uh, Churchill and the Matilda. But it's the 75 millimeter Sherman that comes along that is clearly um, equal to or superior to its uh, competitors in the desert. Okay, as you go a little bit further along the Eastern Front, you start to see that the T-34 is uh, too, too big to handle. And so they upgun the Panzer IV and they introduce the Panther and the Tiger. Okay, and then now as we enter Europe, uh, there are some other tanks like uh, there's some... Cromwell tanks and some newer versions of the Churchill and uh, there's a couple other a couple other lighter tanks. The Americans have uh, I think the M25 light tank, but the the main tanks at this point are the M4. This is the majority tank, and the British have a fair number of the 76 millimeter tanks. Now I've thrown some of these ratios up. These are a little more accurate than what I had in my 30 core presentation of what my personal recollections through. 47 years of reading is generally speaking the 3 to 1 4 to 1 ratios are the ratios I remember reading about hearing about seeing in video you know in documentaries where people are testifying to the what battle they fought in this is the 3 to 4 to 1 ratio is is what you know what I recall uh, to be honest um, didn't really have any information on I've never had any particular impression on the ratios for the Fireflies, you could presume that they're slightly better than the Sherman simply because of the 76 millimeter gun. It, it at least had a chance against a Tiger. But it, this is kind of where the myth of the myth stuff comes in. You, know, you people start throwing around surveys and you know and books and uh, research and all that sort of stuff, and it's like, okay, so what's what's the truth? The truth is we will never know. Um, in order for us to have any truth about tank on tank performance we would need to have a statistically significant and relevant uh, sampling that and by that I mean we'd have to have enough samples and they would have to be sufficiently sterile uh, in other words one m4 on one tiger two m4s on one tiger three f4 m4s on one tiger and no supporting arms no bazookas no panzer faust no close air support etc and if you had a sampling of data, you would need enough to sort of offset, you know, any particular differences in the crew quality or that sort of thing. But assuming more or less functional, fully operational tanks with fully qualified crews, let's say we could find um, a dozen or so engagements. I think you would probably need at least to be to be statistically significant. You would probably need somewhere between, you know, ten and twelve engagements at a minimum to offset the fact that you know this tire tank guy right here he, he had the flu and so this guy got the jump on him right there are little um, you want to take out little biases that might have occurred because of specific situations at any given time okay so if we were doing this out, out on a sterile lab we might do three engagements at 2000 three engagements at 1500 three engagements at a thousand and three engagements at uh, 500 to, to simulate the different ranges and then we would count them up and we say oh three engagements out of 12 gives me a 25 percent ratio whenever we're one to one now the problem is we that's we can't draw any conclusions from this 
It's not until we do a dozen engagements at two to one and a dozen engagements at three to one and a dozen engagements at four to one and five to one that we can establish sort of the breakover point at which a crew has a 50-50 chance of living. Okay, everything above this line, the Sherman has, can be presumed to be victorious. That has, has a better than, you know, average chance of being victorious. So here we have a scenario that, you know, imagine these were statistically uh, relevant and uh, significant, that based on this plot, this guy, to have a 50-50 chance, would need 4.6 to 1 odds, right? So that's how you could, you could use statistics. The problem is, we don't have those engagements. We simply don't have the kind of pure, uh, sterile type laboratory engagements to, to do this. So we will never know uh, the exact ratio uh, that a tank, that M4s needed in order to be successful. What we do know is, and we'll come back to this, is the British, remember, um, Nicholas cited the 2.2 that the British wanted 2.2 to 1. Well, that's pretty consistent with everything you've ever read about the tank, right? This this was a 2.2 to 1 against Panthers, okay? A Panther is not as powerful as a, uh, a Tiger, so presumably if you had a 2.2 to 1 against Panthers, you would probably want something like a 3 to 1 against Tigers. This is consistent with the traditional narrative. The British wanted more Shermans than their enemy to be successful, okay? Now let's take a look at what the Americans said. They thought they were 3.6 times more effective. Basically, that they were at a 1 to 3.6. This data point, I don't know where it comes from. I can't find it. But this is totally inconsistent with everything you have ever read or ever knew about the Sherman tank. And it's in direct um, conflict with a pretty thorough study that we're going to look at in done by the British in 1952. So... This is the problem with statistics, right? Here's a scenario. I'm, I'm the tank platoon leader here, and my five tanks are going out to find some reported Panthers, and we're coming up over this hill, and, uh, you know, they see me, and they kill me because I'm stupid. I, but my wingmen reach out, and they, they avenge my death, okay? Now, what just happened here, okay? This was a 2 to 1, a 2.5 to 1 ratio. It's 5 to 2. Okay, so the Shermans had the advantage the way the British said. They had at least 2.2, and guess what? They won the engagement. But depending on how the survey is done, is if someone's sloppy about their work, and uh, the, I don't think that the British were in this case. I actually think they got it right. Um, but, but you could very easily come away with the impression that, gosh, the tank, the Sherman was more effective, right? It, it was a 1 to 2. Okay, well, that's because without knowing the tactical situation, the sequence of events, all these sort of things right here, the facts, assumptions of the constraint of the survey, you, it's, you, statistics can lie. The only way you get to a 3.6 is if, 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 this, if the survey is basically rigged because there's absolutely nothing to suggest that 3.6, um, that one Sherman could take on 3.6 panthers or tigers and live to tell the tale you know so we're being asked to believe by Zalaga that there's one single Sherman versus tiger engagement in the entire American army in the entire theater during the entire duration from D-Day onward and they won it um, this little I, I, this is actually I thought when I put this slide together that he was referring to the battle of Ericourt but uh, uh, apologize for this afterwards you know when you look at Ericourt that was panthers so I'm not sure which battle he's referring to. He might be referring to the Battle of Pattern, Paderborn. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, if it's not Paderborn, I don't know what it is. Um, so anyway, the, the takeaway is that um, according to Zalaga, there's this one engagement. That means that every single eyewitness, every single American tank crew member who said they engaged a, a Tiger was wrong. Every one of them. And... Okay, so let's do a little on-the-spot vehicle recognition training. You're a new crew member. You have five minutes to learn the, 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 the difference here. Here is a Tiger. Big, long gun. It's a very large tank. It's the largest tank on the battlefield, so size matters. But at a distance, you might not be able to tell that. From the side, you might see this bustle rack. 
you might see a, a long clear sideboard but the most obvious thing are these overlapping road wheels very large road wheels with a slack track okay this is a mark 6 um, tiger this is an older mark 4 well it's got a long gun and from a distance depending on the distance it might be hard to tell the size okay it has a bustle rack so it might be confused there are three things that are going to give away a mark 4 if you can see the uh, spare road wheel rack, this may or may not be visible because they may not have road wheels in here, all right? Spare wheels here, depending on the situation. They have support rollers and they have small uh, road wheels on the track, okay? There's, from the side, you're going to be able to tell the difference most predominantly by the overlapping large road wheels with a slack track, the small road wheels with a support track. That's how you distinguish an M4 from a Tiger. Now head on, they look very similar. So if you're looking head on, you may not see that difference. Tiger versus Panther. Slack track, smooth bore, uh, sidewall here, okay? Probably the two main difference. The main difference is the, is the turret. This is a very distinctive turret from both the front and the side. It's sloped, it doesn't have the bustle rack. It is very distinctive, okay? And it's important to understand, these guys, their lives depended on getting this right. If they mis, uh, misidentify something as a Mark IV when it's a uh, Mark VI or vice versa, their tactics will change and their tact as a consequence, they will die, right? So vehicle recognition is problematic. Distance, dust, haze, humidity, uh, lighting, all those things result in misidentifying uh, your enemy but to suggest that every crew member was every tank commander was wrong in every engagement in the entire theater when you have two you can certainly say anything that has overlapping road wheels isn't a mark four it might it's it's either going to be a panther or a tiger but it's not a mark four and there were people who actually saw tanks from the side so they could see these things okay so it's just not plausible so now let's put your training into into effect what do you see well the first thing you see is this is fiction right because me 109s don't come down and support um tiger tanks now maybe this was on the russian front uh, so we'll give them you know we'll give them a little credit maybe it was over on the russian front okay but what do you see? You see two Tiger tanks, right? It's as obvious as day. They're big, they're smooth, they're, they have flat uh, sideboards, they have slack tracks, they have big overlapping wheels. You can't miss these two. In reality, I actually missed these two tanks right here. The first time I looked at it, I didn't even see these. But as soon as I saw them, almost immediately, the first thing that comes to mind is, that's a short barrel, that's not a Tiger. Okay, so that's, okay, and there's some road wheels. Uh, and their support wheels and oh by the way there's the little black uh, spare tires if you will right there so this is clearly a mark four and it does and it doesn't take long to figure it out short barrel um, support road wheels it's a t it's definitely not a tiger right you're not going to mistake that now this one over here it's hard to see that long barrel a little bit so maybe you don't see that maybe you do but if it's a long barrel you know it's it's a uh, um, and you take a look at the bustle rack, you might say, oh gosh, from the turret, you might say, that that, that could be a Tiger. Mm, but then you can look at the road wheels, you can see the spare wheels right there, and you can look at the support wheels and the road wheels, and, and very quickly you can determine that's not a Tiger, that's a Mark IV. Okay. So remember, these guys' lives depend on it. Do they get it right every time? Absolutely not. But they don't get it wrong every time. Not 100% of the time in a nine months of combat. Okay. Um, Scorched Earth Tiger Tank full documentary out on YouTube starting around 44 minutes into it 15 seconds into it okay these are first hand testimonial, testimonials okay these are I believe British because the British uh, had most of the engagements um, and I did point out I wanted to highlight this one right here for two reasons this is one of the rare occasions where they mentioned five okay now he didn't say he doesn't say in here. Well, we needed five to one. He just happened to say that we had five tanks in our organization, and we opened up on him from ranges of 150. His tank was 150 yards. His his other supporting tanks 
were 200 to 600 yards away. And they couldn't all be lined up exactly directly in front of the tank, so they had different angles to look at this, at this tank, okay? There is no way that five tank, five tank commanders look at a Mark IV and watch their shells glance off of it, right? These are supposedly the Tigers or the uh, M4 75 millimeter is supposed to be able to handle a Mark IV. Um, there is no way that they that five different tanks at this range engage a Mark IV and have it live to tell the tale, and then and then mistake it as a Tiger, right? Yeah, sorry, I just it just doesn't hold up to muster. These guys engaged a, a tiger. They saw it from multiple angles. They shot at it. Their shells were ineffective, and the tiger got away. That is a Sherman on tiger engagement. And oh, by the way, one, two, three, four, five, six engagements. So remember, one of the things that was mentioned, there's only one engagement, but it was specifically between Americans and Tiger Ones. Any assessment of tank-on-tank -tank performance that doesn't include the British, uh, it's just not valid. It's just plain and simple, not valid. So whatever Zalaga's um, angle was of trying to you know, suggest that the M4 was uh, you know, a suitable tank, well, ask the British. They don't have the same point of view. The other thing is, there's no discussion really uh, in about from the German point of view. Um, this is just one guy, Michael Whitman, and he illustrates firsthand the attitude of Germans using they they knew they had superior tanks and they were they their doctrine envisioned them engaging superior numbers and defeating them with their superior tank. And Whitman, in one day, goes down, goes down in Villar Bocage and destroys 17 confirmed tanks. Now, I believe these were Cromwells, um, but the point is, the German Tiger tank commanders, in particular, doctrinally and philosophically, were aimed at our tanks, and they were aimed at taking on um, superior numbers of tanks. He was later killed by some British and Canadians uh, using 76 millimeter uh, Firefly tanks. Okay, so let's go to the survey real quick. Uh, the survey says, uh, this is a good survey. At first I was confused. I was, I was like, uh, Nicholas was, seemed to be using the survey to reinforce the view that the Sherman was better. And, that's not what he said, but in the context of the menu, I, I thought maybe I misheard him. Anyway, bottom line is, um, he doesn't have 12 engagements at, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. He doesn't have 12 en engagements at two-on-one. They don't, they didn't find 12 engagements at three. They didn't have the 60 engagements that I talked about. But if you look at the number of incidents involved, two things are important to take away. The first is they segregate the tank on tank. Down here, they have stuff that where there's additional resources like self-propelled guns, anti-tank guns, etc. Up here, they have tank on tank. Now, they didn't segregate 75 millimeter from the 76 millimeter, but it's specifically against Mark VI, Mark V, mixed, and then Allied versus all types. Uh, so presumably, mostly Mark IVs. Okay, and the overall ratio with Panthers. Tigers and Mark IVs, you know, being the predominant one, of 2.2. And if you, you're, this is important, ratio for ally, of allied for enemy for allied success. In order to win, you had to have 2.2. If you didn't, you were going to lose, period. And he, he also looks at it from the number of engagements from the German point of view. And when, when they were successful, there aren't quite as many engagements. Um, because if you look up in here, he talks about the fact that, um, actually it's I think on the next slide, so let me take a look, let's advance to that real quick. He talks about the fact that most of the time, the British did have the 2 to 1 and 4 to 1 ratio. They had between 2 to 1 and 4 to 1. So in most engagements,
they entered the battle with the necessary 2.2, so that's why you see, if we go back momentarily, that's why you see more successes over here, you know, a higher success rate than for the enemy. They, they entered the battle with sufficient numbers to uh, achieve the, the results they were looking for. Um, here's another extract that talks about uh, you know, the requirement of Sherman's. This page confirms that the 2.2 to 1 requirement of Sherman's to Katz, um, you know, it, it, but more importantly, it illustrates the effect of volume on the results. This bullet right here, it, this statement right here, it will be seen that an average of 11 Allied tanks were successful when opposed by 5, whereas 3 were not successful against 2. So the, this ratio, uh, you know, the, the point is the closer you get to a 1 to 1 fight, the more likely the enemy is to win. When there was lots of tanks on the battlefield and plenty of bullets flying around, the larger number of Allied tanks would overwhelm the smaller number, even if the ratio was ex basically exactly the same. Um, quantity, you know, has a quality all its own. And so this is an important thing to understand. The closer you get to one to one, the smaller the number of tanks engaged, the better the Germans did. Um, and in conclusion, page 33, after page 33, it's mostly photos. It's, uh, it's very good uh, survey but very you know short and they itemize every engagement that they looked at who how many tanks what kind of tanks who fired first who won it's a very good uh, good thing it's as close to that sterile environment that um, that we talked about as you're you know probably going to get the British uh, did a very good job with this survey and it's important to say that more than two allied tanks were required for success against each enemy tank Okay, and remember this calculation. Um, if you're going up against pure Panthers, you might have a 2.2. If you're going against pure Tigers, you might want to have the three to one. So this was the sort of the minimum <laughs> that you wanted. Okay, moving on to uh, the sort of the second piece of this. Remember. How many tanks do you need to win? And, you know, do you want to even be in this tank? Um, the Sherman is a death trap. Um, the Chieftain points out that the, uh, he talks about the armor, the thickness of the armor, the two inch armor with a 45 degree slope equaled, you know, 3.6 effective and the four inches of armor um, at, with the slope equal to four or 4.3, depending on the particular slope you hit. He, so he's talking about, you know, armor effectiveness, and then he also talks about casualties. And, you know, he mentions, wow, the armor crewman knows 3%, 3 you know, infantry, 18%. Okay, so we're going to come back to this, but he, he does a really good job of sort of pointing out you got to be careful how you look at things. Overall, infantry casualties, 18.5%. But one of the leading divisions that was, you know, in the front lines had a 700% casualty rate that it was filled over seven times with replacements over the course of, of the war. Okay, U.S. Armor says 3%. Okay, we're going to come back to this in a moment. So this is kind of my assembly. Imagine that you have to choose a tank. Your life depends on it, right? Which tank are you going to choose? Now these ratios are sort of my um, summary based on my personal you know, recollections of reading and then looking at these various studies. I'm not suggesting they're perfect, but if you're in an M4 75 millimeter against a short uh, barrel Mark IV, you know, you're at a one to one, you're, you might be even a slightly a better than that. You might be able to go one to two, one to two, right? This was a superior tank to this, the, the Mark IV. Four was the inferior tank. Um, fireflies, you know, maybe a firefly could go, you know, one to one against Panthers. But the we're going to talk about frontal armor in a minute. Um, there's there's quite a bit of testimony that suggests that yeah, it's a bigger gun and it could kill the Panthers. But you probably still wanted the two to one, and that's consistent with the two point two to one that the survey points out. Um, 
you know, what ratio do you want to go against tigers? Okay, I don't, I don't know what you want, but um, you know, here's kind of the way I, uh, after looking at all the different studies, this is the kind of the way I've come up with it. If you're in this guy right here, you might be able to handle the short barrel, but if you're going up against the panther in a, a stock. M4 with a 75 millimeter, you're going to want two to one to three to one, somewhere in there, you know, that 2.2 to one ratio, if you will. If you're in fireflies and you're going against tigers, you probably still want that 2.2 to one to three to one. Yeah, your gun's a little better, but um, his gun's a lot better and his armor's better. Um, you know, so, you know, you pick, right? It's your life. Okay. Now, for all those people who say that a firefly is is a peer of the of the panther, um, this is where Cooper's book comes in. You know, death traps. He's showing a photo of a post mortem they did on a tank, a Mark um, Five Panther, that was fired on by a 76 millimeter uh, firefly, two direct hits on the forward slope, and it didn't kill it. Uh, it, uh, it was another shot that killed this tank. So, um, you know. Our, frontal armor and frontal armor this thing was supposed to be able to slice through it well yeah maybe it could but it didn't always okay and then there's also this a tank that we don't really have a good way to if, you know, quite as good a way to evaluate the mark four with the up gun mm, if you're in this sherman here maybe it's one to one maybe it's two to one a firefly can can probably handle it but um Remember, this tank right here was on the battlefield too, and it was on the battlefield with the upgun 75 millimeter high velocity gun because of the experience in Russia, and it basically replaces this guy. So, you know, pick your tank over here on the left and pick your tank between the Tiger, the Panther, or the upgun Mark IV. Hmm, there's one tank on that list that I'm not picking, and that's the M475 millimeter, period, the end, not taking it. <laughs> And to be honest, I'm not taking the Sherman. Um, I'd probably be taking the Panther because I think its reliability was better than the Tigers, it, and it and it, it was a probably the best overall tank. Um, if we're out out in the desert, I'm taking the Tiger because I could shoot them from a long way away. But bottom line is, nobody is going to pick the 75 millimeter tank. Period. The end. Just throw this up here just to point out that the size of the gun made the Pershing, you know, the what-if tank um, competitive. And it was probably overall probably the superior tank on the battlefield. Uh, let's talk real quick about casualties. Remember, he, he, um, Nicholas does a good job of pointing out that, remember, just because you have overall statistics of 18%, you know, when you look at the where the rubber meets the road, there were a lot of infantry divisions that never really either saw combat or saw light combat. The ones that were actually in the fighting, you know, heavy casualties, right? So let's take a look at this ridiculous number, uh, U.S. Armor. And let's take a look at what uh, Cooper says about this, okay? Um, Third Armor enters Normandy with 232 tanks. They have 648 totally destroyed and another 700 knocked out, put back into operation. Loss rate of 580%. Okay, um, you know, I guess depending on how you calculate knocked out versus, but still, 648 to 232 by itself is, you know, what, about a three, uh, three ratio, 300% uh, or so. Um, so pretty significant um, difference. This number doesn't account for um, officers. The officers would, would have been classified under their home branch of, you know, whatever it was, infantry or whatever. So this number is definitely underestimated, um, the officers that were involved. Now, the officers weren't, the, it's not like there was an officer in every tank, so it's not like they represented 20% or something, but officers weren't included. Um, one thing it doesn't include are the fact that folks sent overseas as infantrymen. Um, Cooper talks about the fact that, you know, going back to the survivability of the M4, the, the M4 was the most more escapable tank. Once it got hit, once the crew part, uh, compartment was penetrated, you could get out if you weren't dead. You could get out. You know, the tank commander and the driver had a chance to get out. 
And so two, maybe three of these guys would get out and now they need a new tank, but they don't have a loader and they don't have a gunner, okay? And so they would have to find people to fill those slots. And they went from having five people in a tank to four and then down at one point to three, where the tank commander would drop in and load the gun and climb back up and do, do the duties of the tank commander. Um, so, um, you know, he talks about in his book the need to take raw recruits off the boat and train them. Remember how we did our five-minute training uh, on vehicle recognition? Well, you can train an infantryman to be a loader in, a, a, in four hours, right, in a morning. You show them the, the different ammunition types. You explain what they do. You crawl inside the tank. You show them where to stand. I learned how to fire an M60 tank or load an M60 tank in one day. And that was, it took the whole day because we had a whole platoon to run through it. Um, I learned to be a driver in one day. And then we spent several days doing, days and nights doing driving, but to actually learn to drive it took one day. And that's because we had a platoon of, you know, 30 guys. If it was just a small group, it could have been done in hours. So he, his team actually took a lot of folks and trained them. And so those probably got counted as under the statistics of infantry or whatever branch they came from. And therefore, the 3% is definitely an underestimate. Um, real quick, we talked about the thickness of the armor. Well, guess what? The, uh, the Panther was pretty damn good. Okay, It had 3.5 inches of armor, um, and it had a 38-degree slope. And uh, the 38 deg degree slope is the critical angle. Uh, did some research on this. is was considered the critical angle for you know deflecting shots. So this is a the the consequence is if you if you I couldn't find the official uh, factor. Um, two inches to 3.6 is a 1 1.8 factor. I took that 1.8 factor divided by 38 to 45 to to reduce it to account for the lesser slope comes out to something like 5.3 inches. Now, whether this is exactly right is not the point. The point is this thing had 3.3 inches of armor to start with, and it was 38 degrees slope, which gave it almost as much slope as the Sherman. So by definition, both the Tiger and the Panther were substantially better on the armor front. And I'm going to pull this slide back up and highlight some different stuff. Remember, we talked about this one earlier with the five tanks at 200 to 600 yards. All the stuff in yellow is talking about eyewitness accounts of our armored piercing shots bouncing off of these tanks harmlessly. Okay, this is first person testimony. They're watching this happen. So, and I didn't even highlight all, here's one down here that I didn't even highlight, you know. He had 15 strikes and they all bounced off. Um, so, the, the simple fact is the Sherman, um, did not have the capacity to consistently and routinely um, penetrate German armor, period. Okay, um, and the reason for that, this comes out of Death Traps. He specifically talks about the penetration power and how it varies with the square of the muzzle velocity. Well, I've thrown up the muzzle velocities of the things, 1,500, 2,600, 3,000, 33, and 3,100 respectively. Okay, by the square of the velocity. So these guns aren't just a little more powerful. They're not just 10% more powerful. You know, they are substantially more powerful. When they fire at you, they're going to defeat you. This is the Mark IV. It's going to defeat you unless you shoot it first. Even if you're a Firefly, it's going to defeat you. So a Firefly's only chance against a Panther or a Mark IV was to fire first. Okay. And because it couldn't simply it couldn't absorb the shot, all three of those tanks will kill you. Period. Oh, by the way, if we go back to the how the M4's reputation was earned, a 1500 mil, uh, 1500 foot per second going against a 1500 per, uh, per second, you know, relative armors. There's a reason why the M4 was good about against the Mark IV. It's because it was going against a weak gun. Okay, and its gun was superior, slightly superior. And that's why the M4 was successful. But when you take out the short barrel and you put in the long barrel or you go to the four, uh, the Panther or the Tiger, it's not even close. I just throw the Tiger up or the Pershing up there for reference. Um, 
Cooper points out that this was not as powerful or uh, high velocity a gun, but the larger shell made it effective. It was the most effective gun on the Allied side. Okay, now for those people who would say, well, gosh, you know, the Mark IV and, you know, tank, the M4 shell was, was superior to the Mark IV, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's firsthand testimonial that even the Mark IV, um, with the long gun, <clears throat> you're hoping you didn't have to have a head-on battle. You know, what you're trying to do is get on the side of them. You hit them. If you hit them head-on, it was a waste of your ammunition. We, you had to get them from the side, okay? Here's a guy who's talking about, in this video, you can go out, U.S. Tanks, uh, timeline, 13 minutes and 40 seconds in. You can listen to his testimony. This is him talking, not some survey down the road. Um, he talks about the need for using multiple tanks in order to have one, you know, keep the tank occupied while the others got to the flanks and used it. The bottom line, the inferiority of the M4 was not a myth. Uh, it just, there's, there's too much statistical data. There's too much firsthand testimonial data. There's the armor, you know, the analysis of the armor, the analysis of the, uh, the velocity, you know, the penetration power of the rounds. Um, the M4 was an inferior tank. Now, coming back to what drove all this, if we come back to Operation Market Garden, Sergeant Robinson sitting there, um, this is a 75 millimeter, but down here you can see I got the long ones. He's sitting there with four uh, Sherman 76 millimeter fireflies. He's going to have to go down a single road that does not allow for him to bring his troops or his tanks online against tanks that are in a, in a uh, defensive position. Presumably they're camouflaged. They have forward observers. They may have supporting ar uh, arms like Panzerfausts and any tank guns supporting them. But if even one single tank, even a Mark IV, a Mark IV had the ability to penetrate the frontal armor of these tanks. Even a Mark IV, a single Mark IV in defense, proper defensive position, would have been able to take down a single column, in my opinion. Now, if the tactical situation were to allow a wedge formation or, you know, an online formation, a breast formation, um, perhaps. But that's the assumption that you're only going to run into one tank. You're, you know, here you are at, at Nijmegen. All the troops that were in, at Nijmegen had to go somewhere. Where were they going? They were going north, and where were they going? They were going to Arnhem. And so every single tank had to get out of the way uh, in order for you to, to even get to the bridge. It's just ridiculous. Um, now, I was sloppy. I just threw up some quick and down and dirty parameters. So I would say that I agree that the 5 to 1 is a myth. But... The fact of the matter is, the Sherman was an inferior tank in a a many to one. I think that a two to one is was not realistic. A three to one, four to one ratio between Shermans and their German counterparts, which is consistent with the narrative that I've always read, was is appropriate. It is real, and it was real in contemporary times. They knew it. No one would have chosen, would have gone one-on-one -on -one with a Tiger, period, in any form of Sherman, in any Allied tank. They wouldn't have done it. Um, I mean, if they were caught in the open, they would have to, but they would not have accepted those odds because it would have been suicide. And when you look at 30 Corps, the fact of the matter is that even if those four tanks magically drove up the road against and there were no Germans, there were absolutely no one, and they rolled over the, the bridge into the bridgehead. Four hours later, they would have been captured right along with the infantry. And the reason is uh, Colonel Frost's men had no bullets. The, the real problem with the Operation Market Garden lies in the fact that the exploitation force that was pushed across the Nijmegen bridges consisted of four tanks instead of 40. Consisted of four tanks instead of four tanks plus some infantry plus some artillery plus some supply trucks to bring bullets to the airborne guys, right? Uh, a, they wouldn't have gotten there. 
with any resistance and B, if they had gotten there, they didn't bring enough resources to sustain the bridgehead. And so Robinson's men would have died uh, or been captured. So I think that's uh, where we're going to end this. I'm curious what you think. Does anybody know where the Schaaf uh, directive is? Did, you know, did Patton really have any influence or not? I don't know. Um, do you agree with me? Disagree with me? Do you, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, the uh, concept? I, you know, I think the five to one is probably a, a newer thing, but three to one, four to one. What do you think? Um, love to hear your comments and uh, we'll talk to you next time.